Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shahab Karni from the studios of I-95 Television in Washington. I am joined. I'm greatly honored that somebody is joining me. That last week I talked to him briefly about his family background, but at the end he touched something which really uh, coordinated with my heart, with my passion about economic empowerment, poverty alleviation, especially in a region which is so deprived for the last 74 years. In Pakistan, we call it Balochistan. Shahal Khan, how are you today? Assalamualaikum, Shahbhai. I'm absolutely fine. Lovely well, to see you again. I know. Thank you very much for joining me. And I promise you that we're going to take up from where we left last week. And this was about your passion for that region, not only for Pakistan, but India, Pakistan, and especially for Balochistan for reasons. So before we go to that particular topic, my question to you, Shahal Khan, why we, you feel so strongly about that region? What is your connection? Just to reinforce the thought process for our audience. Go ahead, Shahal. Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the family link, it's the DNA, and, um, and it's, uh, there's an emotional connection there that I immediately feel when I go to the region, when I go especially to to Pakistan, you know, obviously uh, that's our uh, um, culture that's the closest to me. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, for me, it's just something that I feel innately in my heart that I must uh, uh, be able to help in whatever way I can. Um, it's, uh, um, it's a passion um, that has evolved in me uh, through uh, many, many links to my uh, family, to, to, to my great grandfather, my grandfather. Here you, and the here you yeah. go. <laughs> All right. Oh, so, yeah. so explain where is your great grandfather, his name, his background with Mr. Jinnah, who founded yeah. Pakistan? Yes. Yeah, so, so my great grandfather is um, uh, fourth to the right of Jinnah. So he is uh, in the Fez and he has a bit of a beard and, uh, and a white uh, 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 kurta pajama there, uh, and uh, his name is uh, Ziral Hassan Mirza Beg, and um, he, this was 1906. This was at the Nawab of Dhaka house, uh, the time that uh, the party was formed. And uh, actually, the um, person standing behind him, funny enough, happened to be also a a, a, a person from. It turned out to be. Uh, a friend of mine I went to college with, that's his grandfather that was one of the, uh, I would say he was one of the main zimadars from Mardan in Pakistan standing behind him. Uh, there are a few other uh, Nawabs sitting there on the left as well. I don't remember all the names. We, we still have to do a lot of historical checking <laughs> on that picture. So yeah. that shows the family bond, the linkages, not from yesteryears, but long time back, like 1900. So, yes, yeah, so that is the reason, audience, viewers, for Shahal Khan to feel so strongly about that region, about the people and about the economic prosperity and development. Shahal, my next question is, why your interest in minerals? What happened? You know, minerals, uh, I'm an economist. So when I looked at the, the issues that we are facing in Pakistan uh, with the national uh, balance of uh, uh, reserves of uh, dollars in the account, our ability to pay off the debt from China, um, our ability to really be a, a world-class country in terms of um, the government having the resources to create infrastructure, to create economy. Um, the closest thing that we have uh, and it's sitting in right in our backyard is the minerals, the gold, the copper, the rare earths. We have almost every rare earth on the planet in Pakistan. This, you know, uh, gold, copper, the rare earths are really the fuels of the future. They are the oil of the future and we have it in abundance. Um, there's a belt called the Tatian belt that goes from Afghanistan through Balochistan uh, into Iran, Turkey, and then Eastern Europe. And it is because of the Eurasian plates, uh, you know, colliding um, into uh, uh, that region uh, of where we have um, the greatest amount of minerals. It's been pushed up. And uh, in essence, 
this uh, uh, these amount of resources, if you connect it also to Afghanistan, are two trillion dollars. And the Afghanistan side also will need, you know, the Pakistan side in order for, I believe, processing and export of these minerals to the ports that we're having created in Gwadar and, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative that's going on. So in my view, uh, number one, these minerals can create a, a, a world-class uh, tier one economy for the country. But then there'll be a butterfly effect, right? Because the Belt and Road, uh, Road Initiative that has been created in uh, Pakistan, that has been created, along that periphery, we can create uh, many other jobs, many other industries that will now um, be uh, spun out or born out of the mineral resources. So literally, we're talking about uh, an economy over the next 50 years that can go into uh, the hundreds of billions of dollars. To give you one example, the Rekodik mine, just that one mine, which is only one mine, and people confuse it with a region. It's not. It's one mine. There's 13 other mines like this. And that mine has reserves of $60 billion that were found by TCC, which is a company that drilled. But the real value there is over $100 billion today, at today's price of gold, right? So my vision has been that, number one, we mine that gold but we mine it through a company that is owned and controlled in Pakistan by the government, uh, by uh, uh, the, the, the defense forces. So we know it's a long-term initiative that will give to the protection of the nation, as well as uh, there'll be no chance of corruption. Also, there'll be no chance of that money leaving the country. The other thing is, is that that bullion, the gold, we keep it in the country. Right, and we build up the balance sheet of the country, and that bullion is managed well. Today, I'll give you an example. China, uh, when it started doing the mining in Sandak in Balochistan in the 1970s, um, I traced exactly the amount of ore that they took out of Sandak and they created bullion in China, and it is over $20 billion. And what did the Balochis get out of that? What did the government of Pakistan get out of that? Literally nothing. If you look at the area in Chagai, in, in uh, that area, um, and I had some of the people, you know, that uh, from the mining company that I had started before go out there. And they told me the mining camps of the Chinese are better than the people, the villages that are living there. So I learned from all of that. And, and I learned about what resources were there. And as an economist, I said, we are, uh, uh, number one, sitting on resources uh, that can help us, right? And we're not developing them because we're not able to make a consensus on how to get going. On top of that, we have this court case with Barrick, um, which could be easily settled. You know, I mean, I think it's better just to settle it rather than kicking it down the can on the road. It's a $6 billion settlement. Uh, the mine is worth over $100 billion. Um, you know, there are many others uh, like me, but that are, you know, uh, have connections in banking and finance. It's not hard to securitize that. You know, you just have to give uh, investors um, some security on that asset. But, uh, you know, those bonds can be raised and that settlement can be paid and that mine can be started. And those resources can be kept in the country to give us the strength. And that is why I became interested in it. And not for myself, but I saw that it is for the future of the country. And uh, I think it is something that we must handle very carefully and with a lot of uh, empathy and concern for our own people. Empathy. You said it all. Now, my question to you, Shahal Khan, for the last 74 years, since 1947, what happened? What went wrong? Why, as a state? Nobody picked up on this initiative to develop this sector. What is wrong? What is missing? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, there's so many factors. Uh, one is, of course, let's just talk about the gold price, right? Um, you know, the gold price after the gold standard was cut off, uh, it really started here in America. The price of gold uh, dropped tremendously. We had a lot of, I would say, initiatives by the U.S. government to promote the dollar. The dollar was really being, you know, supported by oil and gold fell and fell and fell. I mean, in the, 
in 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 the 80s gold was uh, less than 200 bucks it was you know cost uh, more to pull it out of the ground than it was worth also when you look at the mineral belts in the world the major deposits in the world uh, they were being mined mostly in africa and then they started in uh, latin america and then in southeast asia and australia now what's going on is the world uh, surface mines that are world-class mines are depleting and there's nowhere else to go to get the sort of reserves left than in this belt and what has happened by default of number one the gold price is being so low and not coming back up really until uh, you know uh, this decade uh, uh, combined with the wars you know the the, the wars that have happened in Afghanistan uh, all that uh, that has happened with Pakistan geopolitically um, you know, that has left this region unmined because most mining companies that are major ones would not want to come in and mine in this region because of the geopolitics and the conflicts. So this is uh, why it was 74 years they weren't exploited in, in a proper way. There's one other thing. The BHP, which was the original owner, which is a big uh, uh, mining group uh, of Recodic, they gave this up because of that same you know, reason that they were focusing more on their other major mines. And they had sold these mines we currently have to TCC. And TCC uh, wanted to start mining uh, uh, you know, in, the, in the 2000s. But you know, they uh, had some issues obviously with our government and they were kicked out. And I think that also stalemated some initial upside but I think it may be to our favor because if we can do this ourselves, which is what I've always said, and bring in the expertise, then we can define and keep the resources in the country for the country itself. Because if they would have started, maybe they would have done the same thing as the Chinese and we would have just been, you know, like Africa, right? Africa, why do the countries in Africa remain so poor? They give up all their resources, you know? And this is the mistake that we must learn from and, and do it correctly, I think. Question to you, when you say one estimated one trillion or two trillion, including Afghanistan, how you or the authentic or credible analyst, analytic bodies reach to that conclusion of estimate? What are the basis? Yeah, so what happened was, you know, I had a very lucky uh, kind of circumstance because I happened to be, you know, um, in Washington, D.C and having access to Washington, D.C. What happened was when I was uh, um, first looking uh, at the mines in Balochistan, I was also introduced to some of the U.S. people that had uh, done the investigations in Afghanistan with the task force. Because what happened is during that Afghan uh, uh, um, invasion after the U.S. took over, they brought in a task force. And this task force in, I think it was now the mid 2000s, they used the U.S. satellites that were given by General Petraeus uh, to use this um, uh, technology that can look deep in the ground from the satellite and see all the ore bodies that had the deposits. That was first. Second is they were able to translate a lot of the Russian drilling in that region in Afghanistan, but it is the same belt that goes into Balochistan. So with the combination of these two things, the Americans were able to have a very good sense of what is there, you know? And I was lucky enough to some contacts I have uh, in Washington to be able to see those documents. And that was the first. The second was that when I was uh, started my initiative in, in Balochistan, I, I had very good contacts also at uh, Barrack, the Barrack Gold side. It just happened to be that the guy, uh, the person that started the company in one of his daughters is a friend of mine, but just friends, you know, we're not, uh, we don't talk business. She's very much of a philanthropist. And, right. but, but I was able to see the reports, actual, the actual feasibility report studies that these guys have. And that's not usually, you know, um, available yeah. for normal people. Mm -hmm. And that really decided for me to, you know, uh, make my decisions as to why this is so important for us you know, to keep. So thank you very much, Shahal. Uh, for last four or five days, I have been doing this story about you. But so I did some due diligence and investigation from the American quarters also. And you are so right. They have all the information which they say close to 
90% is so correct, you know, for last, not only three or four or five years, but for almost 25 years, believe you me. But the, my question to you as a follow-up, keeping, keep that American interest and the studies and the value that they have and keep on the ground, you know, we're Balochistan, we have Irani, Afghanistan, we have got China, we have got Indian proxies, we have got Israeli proxies, how there will be a peace in that region so that you can go forward or people like you can move forward with that initiative. Go ahead. I think what we have to do is, I, I'm going to make it very simple because politics and all this stuff will never end. We have a resource that everybody needs. We have, we, and we go and we focus on just making sure those resources are coming out of the ground, number one. Number two, we focus on that we vertically integrate. So we create battery factories like Elon Musk is doing, right? Because we have the lithium in Pakistan as well. Then we start selling our wares. Listen, the Indians don't have uh, um, our minerals, right? Uh, and they will need our minerals. We're, you see, we have some incredible luck in uh, having these minerals over there. When you look at the economic benefits that are going to come to China, that are going to come to 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 India, they're going to come to Iran um, because they're going to need uh, these minerals. And uh, uh, Iran also has a lot of these minerals, but Iran is under the sanctions. You know, Pakistan, because of where it sits, it can be a supplier to China. Also, it can be a supplier to the United States. Look, the United States right now is in a panic because all of the rare earth minerals are supplied by China. China today is the only country in the world that does complete vertical integration of processing of all the rare earth minerals that are in our phones. <laughs> These guys decide to do any blockade to us, we're finished. So what I've been telling a lot of the people here in Washington, because sometimes, you know, they take a long time and they're too much into the politics, is yes. listen, Pakistan has been a friend of the United States since it's forming, since 1947, has been a good ally. And now uh, I don't, uh, you know, uh, debate with people that have their own political uh, sort of agendas, but I look at it practically that Pakistan can be a good friend of the U.S. and supplying U.S. with the supply of rare earths that it requires. So it's not uh, fighting with China over this. So I think we have to do it through economic means. So you think an economic win-win situation for all the stakeholders that I just described and mentioned in that region, that includes, of course, American interest. Somebody or some force has to come out of box, kind of a creative solution to bring all the stakeholders on one in one room. And as you said, hey, this is for you. This is for you. Everybody is in a win-win situation. So ultimately, the winners will be those poor, deprived people of that region. What do you have to say? I do agree. And, you know, one thing in my discussions with certain people in the EU parliament, the Europeans are very much for supporting Pakistan tremendously, especially um, uh, the people that I'm speaking to, which have gone as far as saying that we will help Pakistan in terms of giving Pakistan guarantees in uh, development of the mineral through financing. So I think, you know, a way to break this and to benefit the people, number one, is to go to the parties that are uh, willing to help us, you know, now and, 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 and take the funding in in order to settle the issue with Barrick, start to develop the mines and make sure that when we do develop those mines, a certain portion of that in the structure that I'm speaking about goes to the people through a sovereign wealth fund scenario. And, and this will be where I think the interest in the country that the Balochis have, that the, the other people have, because we must look at it ourselves as a nation. We must look at ourselves as a people, not as tribalists. And, and uh, um, I think once people see that this is moving forward and everybody has come together in a decision to make it go forward, the, at the ultimate goal will be the people will benefit uh, uh, out of this. And hopefully, what my hope, hope is and my prayers are that they could uh, start to look forward and put aside uh, the divisions that have been going on for so long. Yeah, I mean, if you empower those local people there, you know, they are less 
uh, probability of becoming or making them terrorists in the region, you know, because everybody's making money. So that's the bottom line here. So it's a common yeah. sense. I mean, it's not a rocket science. Yeah. Shahal, my question to you, because I've been reading about you a lot, you know, for the last couple of weeks, you have a background, of course, not only feeling passion or empathy or feel good, but you're an economist. You have created, if I'm not mistaken, two different banks in, in other regions. My question to you for way forward, don't you think it would be a good idea to have a, an international mineral development bank for that region that then maybe the story can evolve around that? What do you have to say? I think what can happen yeah. is um, the mineral, uh, not, I mean, the, 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 the bullion should be deposited in a bank for sure. I think what bank uh, uh, is created uh, by the government uh, uh, will be left to, uh, you know, I would say people that in the finance ministry and so on that uh, feel is the best for the long term preservance of that value. But I definitely believe that um, the mineral, especially the gold, should be kept in a sort of an asset management, um, you know, uh, sort of um, structure that can add to the balance sheet of the country. And once that happens, then, uh, you know, it can have a mandate to uh, finance infrastructure projects, other mineral projects. But I think these should be done through joint ventures. So one private of the and public partnership, yeah, public exactly. and private partnerships. Yeah, exactly. So I think this initial startup, let's say, of, of developing, let's I'm just saying record dick, right, should be done in a in a in a public private partnership. We should bring in private uh, groups that can finance it, uh, also mine it, because this isn't a small mine. This is a world-class mine, and only a few companies in the world can um, mine this at, at, at that level. But they are, they're, they're there, and, and they're happy to come in. Um, and if it's a government-owned part company, they will also feel safe because they'll have government guarantees because some of the uh, companies feel afraid if they come in by themselves, they do all the resource planning, they do all the investment, and then governments take the mines over, right? It's happened over and over again to some of these mining companies around the world where there's nationalization. But if they're yes. already in the PPP, that, that goes away, that fear goes away. And some of these guys have talked to me about that. And I said, well, the best structure is a public-private partnership. And then within that public-private partnership, there's an agreement to create this separate uh, uh, investment company, an asset management company that manages the actual uh, uh, resource, which is, I think, the biggest resource here could be the bullion. And because there can be billions and tens of billions of dollars of the bullion created just from this one mine. And then that uh, enables um, a, 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 a specialized bank for infrastructure investment and development, which can also be used to pay back the loans to the Chinese, for for example, for the uh, Belt Initiative, that is uh, the 46 billion in debt, and, and so on and so on. Sahar Khan, my final question to you, sir, is that I see you as a, you have a vision for that region, for that particular sector, and you have empathy. Now, for way forward, as a catalyst, if I had to ask you the final answer or final question of my this segment, what do you want to see? You know, how you can be, uh, you can be leveraging this initiative or this concept. What do you need? What is missing? I think, you know, this COVID has really uh, stopped my travel. Um, otherwise, I would have gone to Pakistan in my plan was in February, actually. And, you know, it's to meet with the relevant uh, authorities in Pakistan. I've gone there many times and met with them and tell them, look, we, we, we have a solution, you know, and, and the solution, there are willing parties that are credible parties that are willing to finance the initiatives of the government and, and, of our um, country uh, to 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 do the settlement, you know, with Recodic, and and to move us forward, right? Um, and I think that's that's my short-term objective, really, to focus to uh, uh, bring credible uh, a credible team, a delegation to the country, and uh, have the powers that be meet with them, and to verify their credibility and to see that we do have a solution here. And it's a fast solution. Look, some of these guys are also willing to finance what we have in the ground without even mining. So, I mean, the financial structures are there with some willing 
solid, uh, uh, um, you know, organizations, institutions, especially European that I've been speaking to, that are willing to give us the money so we're not in limbo, you know, uh, and we can move forward. Uh, so that is my very short-term initiative. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, I'll be able to travel in the next few weeks and uh, I will uh, hopefully achieve that. You're not taking this inshallah from Joe Biden, by the way. No, no, <laughs> you know, inshallah was more of a Saudi. No, thank you very much, Shahal Khan. God bless you. God bless your vision. Uh, from I-95, whatever we can do in our limited capacity, we'll always be there to promote and project and get the word out to the relevant quarter, I promise you. So um, with those words, Shahal Khan, please, I mean, from Shahab Karni from I-95 Studios, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will be joining you very soon with a new story, a new theme, and also with the promise that I'm sure we will have a lot of follow-up questions from our viewers for Shahal Khan on this subject. And Shahal, with the promise from you that we will have, conti will continue the conversation. Thank All you, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you, sir. God bless you.